Amen. I want you guys to go to 2 Timothy um, chapter 2, verse 15, before we get into this. Because it's important that you know why we do what we do. 1 Timothy, sorry. 1 Timothy. Um, the why two, behind the what? Oh, hold on. Let me make sure. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Mm-hmm. It's important that you understand, yes, like you said, why we do what we do. Everything you're blessed, everything that we see like from sight is a counterfeit to what God's kingdom actually is. And it's our job as Christians to bring heaven to earth. And so we know in heaven, there's no influence of darkness whatsoever. And so we're surrounded by a world that's full of darkness because the enemy and those third of the heavens that disobeyed with him, they live here. And so we feel and see the effects of their work ever since Adam and Eve sinned. And so what we do when we get saved, we're immediately taken out of that kingdom. It would be like, I don't really like like sci-fi movies, but it would be like we would immediately, once we get saved, be in like where Thor lives. Mm-hmm. Okay. We don't know anything about that kingdom. We don't know anything about how to relate to that kingdom. We would have to completely learn the language. We would, I mean, they eat different foods. If you've ever watched any of the Avengers or any of those sci-fi movies. So when we get saved, it's like we're immediately translated into a totally different place. But we have to learn what that place is like because we're actually occupying two places at once. I want you to write down the phrase dual citizenship. Dual citizenship. Someone who has dual citizenship belongs to two places and they can roam freely from one to another. We are actually in this world. We're citizens of America, if you are, and if you're not, welcome. You got to say that. We welcome any illegals that may be here today. Come on in. We're, we're not judging. Okay. So you're an American citizen. Hopefully. If not, okay, you're here. But you're also a citizen of heaven. So write it down. You're an American citizen. And if you aren't, write it by faith. <laughs> My sister-in-law's husband... And just got his citizenship. He is Norwegian. Is that right? Norway is Norwegian? Correct. He's Norwegian. They don't celebrate Thanksgiving, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Super awkward first Thanksgiving celebration. How would you guys celebrate? Uh, it's actually an American holiday. And then every story of the pilgrims and the Native comes Americans rushing comes back. rushing back. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Ah, sure enough, it is an American forgot, holiday. Forgot about that, buddy. All right. Two places at once, okay? Which means you still have to operate here legally. Mm -hmm. You can't speed and drive your car as fast as you want because you're a citizen of heaven. That's right. Okay? You're still bound by some things in this natural earth's system. Amen. But the goal is that through renewing our mind to the word that we bring heaven to earth. And guys, this starts with bringing heaven to earth to your earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many of you guys would like to have heaven on earth? Because that's what Reverend John George talked about. He talked about not only having a position, but practicing that position. If you get cast onto a team, like tell me what position you played in football. Fullback. Okay. But also running back. Were you running back? Running back. Fullback my junior year. Okay. Tailback my senior year. Now you didn't really like basketball, but what position did you play in basketball? The bench. I know, (laughs) but when you play, I was like Dennis Rodman. I was just, I was a monster on the rebounds and I was an instigator. Okay. It was just like my threes just weren't hitting anything, not even the rim. Okay. (laughs) Not even the backboard. Track though. You were the fourth. They put you in last. Correct. Because you could fix whatever hadn't gone right. Amen. Okay. So you were the fastest. So well, my team was so good, I would just get it in first place, and then we would just win with ease. I was basically jogging the whole time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so what are, are there any other sports that you had a specific position? Baseball. Third base. Okay. Boom. Because 
Pastor Greg went to a really small school. And so at his school, you had to play every sport if you were going to play you were like, sport. The guys were encouraged to play all the sports, but the girls basically had to because the same lady that coached the basketball coached volleyball and coached track. So if you didn't go off for track, your butt was right in the pine in basketball and volleyball as well. That sounds horrible. Well, and they did have a lot of state championships. So it worked. Okay, so you get on the team, you're a certain position, you got to practice, mm-hmm. right? So if you're the running back, you wouldn't, pla- you wouldn't practice kicking because right. you're not the kicker. Right. If you're the quarterback, you're not going to practice kicking because you're the quarterback. Right. Do you understand? So it's not enough that you have a position. And so let's That's start good. with 2 Timothy 2, 15. My Bible, I have the New Living. It says, do you have the King James? Yeah. Okay, read the King James first, and then we'll read it in the New Living. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, one translation. Does anybody say study? Study? What translation do you have, Tristan? King James. Thanks. What? He has a King James. No, it says study. You have the King James, right? Got it. And it says study? 2 Timothy 2.15. Perfect. I like that. So, study. What translations do y'all have? Amplified. Amplified says study too. ESV says study ESV. too. Mine says work hard. Work hard, study, be diligent, all the same thing. Yep. We have to train in righteousness. I want you to write that down. It's not enough that you know you're righteous. It's not enough that you have righteous friends. You've got to practice it on your own, right? So you are responsible for showing up to practice like ready to go. Right. It wasn't enough that your teammates were ready to go. You had to be ready to go. Right. So guys, it's not enough that you go to a church where everyone else is ready to go. You still have a responsibility to get ready to go. That's why we come to church and we go over these scriptures so that you learn how to perform in your position, right? And this happens in anything. Like when I was in choir, I was an alto, like mezzo, mezzo alto, which is like in between soprano and alto. And so we would be given a part and we would have to learn our part. Mm. And if we don't learn our part, then it throws off the piece of music. So I was given my part based on my voice And I had to practice. Each of you guys have, we all have the same position. So nobody's better than the other. In sports, certain people's position pays y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like what did Aaron Judge just sign for? Can y'all pull up a picture of Aaron Judge? A bazillion dollars per game. So guys, in sports, it's not necessarily fair. Do y'all know who Aaron Judge is? Aaron Judge is <laughs> Aaron Judge is a pitcher for the or a hitter for the New York Yankees. Um, just fun fact, like Pastor Dean's shirt today on the little pocket. I like that it's like low key. Low key. So it looks like a dress shirt, just yep. straight up with a pull suit that, coat on. Pull that suit coat back. That, boom. Yankee Yankees logo. logo. Yankee Legit. logo, guys. Yankee logo. Still- Any Yankee fans in here? couple people. Stealth. Strong. I mean, it's strong in the Shropshire house. Strong. Okay. Have any of you guys ever done track and field before? Have any of you ever th- tried to throw a shot put before? You just throw it and it like barely goes anywhere, right? Right. You just barely goes. So the people that throw a shot, they have to practice their form and holding it right here and spinning around without falling down. Same way with discus. Have you ever tried to throw a discus before? And you spin and spin and spin and then you throw it in the wrong direction. Well, they have to practice what it is that they're doing. They have yeah. to practice their position. Just like uh, somebody who's good at high jump doesn't go over and practice long jump. Right. No, they go and they practice high jump or they practice long jump. Whatever their position is, that's where they practice. Well, and what's important, what I was, the point that I was trying to make is like, in the world, everybody has different positions right. and different pay. In the church, and that's Hallelujah. why we have to renew our mind. In the kingdom of God, different position, same pay. Yep. And you need to write that down. What that means is God wants all of us to have more than enough. Mm-hmm. Now that may look differently to all of us, but 
It doesn't matter if you're in the ministry, if you're, if you own a business, if you work for another business, if you're a stay at home mom, whatever it is that God's called you to do, you still have a wealthy place Mm -hmm. and your prosperity is tied to what you're sowing. Your prosperity isn't tied to your paycheck. Your prosperity is tied to your sowing. Now, Aaron Judge's prosperity is tied to his pitching, to his talent. I keep saying that, to his hitting. He's not a pitcher. To his talent, okay? So last year, at the end of the season, moving into, which, y'all, I mean, we're not here to discuss baseball. But if we were. But he had a great season. He broke a world record. Isn't he like six, seven or something? Yes, he's massive. You and Pastor Dean were there to witness him breaking that record. It was amazing. Just a father, son, father, son. Threw popcorn in the air and threw nachos everywhere and we rejoiced. Actually, Pastor Dean was eating popcorn and I was like videoing and I turned. He's like, yeah, he's got like popcorn in his mouth. (laughs) Okay. Picture again. He just signed a nine year contract for $360 million. $360 million. Okay, guys, there's other players that are hitting with all their might also not making but for less than 360 million 360 million okay that's the world's when you see him that's in person, why you're pro he's like so big yeah he's massive he's so tall six seven it's so tall i feel like one person should stand and then another person should stand on top of them that in this be, room and then we would know. Six, Just kidding. It would be dangerous. <laughs> that sounds bad. Yeah. Okay. Helmets. Bring your helmets. Guys, that's why we have to renew our mind. Okay. Because you're programmed. You have to get a good job. You got to get a degree so that you can be successful. That's the world's definition of success. That's not God's definition of success. That doesn't mean you can be lazy in school. That doesn't mean that you don't need to have a job. Pastor Greg and I started working when we were in fifth grade. Fifth grade. We started working. We, we had a job. And then we always had a job. I always had jobs in this. I, I always had a job. And that's not because my parents couldn't afford to buy me things. That's because I knew that the hand of the diligent becomes rich. Hallelujah. I knew from an early age that it's important not to just lay around all day and be lazy. Right? Even when I went to Bible school, you know, so many people complain, I just don't have time. I just don't have time. I went to Bible school and I worked full time. I went to school from nine to noon. And then I went to work from 1.30 to 10 at night. Every day, Monday through Friday. You have time. I'm not telling you to get a job. You walk out of here, Pastor Charity said, I have to get a job. I did not say that. But I did say that the world's definition of success is not God's definition of success. And you have to renew your mind to know what Matthew 6.33 says. That if I seek first the kingdom, he will add everything else to me. God, what is it that you have me? If I'm supposed to be a youth pastor, and that's what God's called me to do, but I say, I don't like how much the church can pay me, and I go do my own thing, how is that going to go for my life? Mm. How is that going to go? Like poop. It's going to go bad. It's going to go bad. I'm no different than you guys. You already in between your ears, you got to sort this out. I'm going to follow God's plan for my life no matter what. And I'm going to be rich and I'm going to be blessed and I'm going to be healthy and I'm going to have everything that I need. I'm going to do it God's way. The Bible says the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow. Everyone say no sorrow. No sorrow. Well, I just don't feel like I'm, I'm increasing. Well, it takes time. You sow you reap, you put your words on it correctly. Don't talk doubt. Don't talk unbelief. Well, it just doesn't seem like I'm going anywhere. Where are you going to go? Do you know what I'm saying? Like I could have said that after year one of being in youth ministry. Uh, uh, This is definitely not going anywhere. No one listens. No teenagers are like on fire for the Lord. It's what I'm not going anywhere. Where am I going to camp? (laughs) <laughs> it's crazy to think that Do you know what there's I'm saying? people that were in, in, in our, when we started youth ministry, they're like married with kids now for facts, but they're going somewhere. But we were like, it's like, where are we going? Do you know what I mean? Well, I just don't feel like my life. Are you where God told you to be? We've had people ask us that before. What's next after Hobbs? Uh, I'm going to stay here until more of this. More of the same. We did get a Duncan. Let's Woo! go. 
We got a Chili's. Come on, y'all. We got a Rosa's. Come on. Look at us. We got a McAllister's. Is anybody going to McAllister's? Whoa. Okay, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Like, if you don't renew your mind to the word of God, you're going to make stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. And you're going to abandon ship, and you're not going to experience everything that God's provided for you. I just don't feel like my life's going anywhere. Can I tell you that by the world's definition of success, we are definitely going nowhere. Okay, because when you're our age, you've already graduated out of youth ministry like five years ago. At least. A lot of our friends, like they're like, we don't have them come speak at youth camp anymore because they don't do youth ministry anymore. Facts. Because once you're our age, you graduate out of that. That's like a stopping point between like real, like starting in the ministry and like real ministry. Learn to preach with the teenagers. And then if you're good enough, you can go to adults. I'm just saying, you got to get your mind right. Yeah. And you can't wait until you're 18 or you're 21 and you got a couple, couple girls looking at you, a couple boys looking at you. Hey, it's time to get married. Time to have kids. All my friends are doing it. Everyone graduated from college. And what? <laughs> and? And what? I just don't know where my life's going. I know where my life's going. 700 more till Paso. Every day. The will of God is the only place for your safety. It's the only place for your protection. But that starts with you getting it right in between your ears right now, which is why we don't, get, we don't do soul ties right now. Mm. We don't sleep with people we're not married to. We don't sneak around. We don't date. We don't try to have these little boyfriend and girlfriends because that's one of the number one tools the enemy uses to get you off track and out of the will of God is some little relationship. I just need somebody. You need Jesus is what you need because you're going to stand before him at the end of your life and you're going to be accountable for what he called you to do. Mm -hmm. So don't be that person that's going through the motions, but in the soundtrack of your mind is like, never enough, never, never. I just don't feel successful. Maybe I'm talking to leaders in here today. I'm just saying, like, that is so soft. Like, do you think that the Son of God hung on the cross and felt like success as he gave his life for lost humanity with no guarantee that anyone was going to say yes. Do you think he hung on that tree? Like this is the definition of success as he was bleeding out. Nuh-uh, you don't know him. You don't know him. You don't know him like you should. And I don't know who I'm talking to. Everyone in the room's like, they're online. They're online. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm telling there. you, you're at a crossroads and you better fix it. That's good. You're at a crossroads and you better fix it. Because if you're toying with those kind of conversations, the enemy has you exactly where he wants you. Mm -hmm. And he can very easily, with one foul swoop, sweep in and take you out. Mm -hmm. If you're toying with that, I don't feel valuable. I don't feel successful. I don't feel like my life is going anywhere. You were born to die. Write it down. And you're going to die one way or the other. You're either going to choose to die to your flesh or the enemy will kill you. One of two ways. You're either going to choose to die to your flesh. I chose when I was 18 years old. I give up. I'm not going to do my plan. I'm going to go your way, God. And I never turned back. So you either choose to die and do it right now. Do it right now by just taking 15 minutes out of your day and having a legit quiet time. Do it now. Turn off the game long enough. Do it now. Do your homework. Be honest. Don't hide. Don't lie. Keep your room clean. Keep your room clean. Do it now. So that when you're in high school, you're already like rolling. You know how many high schoolers are already broken? Mm -hmm. You know how many young adults, young 20-somethings, they didn't have this when, when they were your age. They've got baggage. They've got stuff to deal with because they didn't have the opportunity that you have. Mm -hmm. Don't take it lightly. 
Don't take it casually. Every week is an opportunity to grow. Every week is an opportunity to grow higher. So do that. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it lightly. Do it now so that you already have that foundation laid. Because if you're toying with that, you were born to die. You either choose to crucify your flesh or the enemy will take you out. And I don't mean like die early. I'm not like prophesying doom and gloom. I'm saying the death of your purpose. How many young people have we pastored, called to the ministry, knew God had a plan for their life, responded to an altar call as an eighth grader, as a ninth grader, maybe as a senior in high school, but didn't stay the course because they didn't renew their mind. They didn't study what God's word said about their future and about their purpose. And they're too busy on Instagram and listening to their family and friends who don't, wouldn't know God from peanut butter. And you know him, you've experienced his love. You've encountered his presence and you're going to buck out for some money for a boyfriend for a world's definition of happily ever after. You're soft, man. That's so soft. That is so soft. This this is not the church for that. There's like another church for that. This ain't it. This ain't it. And I'm telling you, you you are at a crossroads today and it's like ride or die. Like you decide. I'm in or I'm out because we don't do that here. It's toxic. Mm -hmm. That's a toxic mentality. Jesus did not hang on the cross, giving his life, questioning his life's worth. We don't, we don't toy with that in our mind. That's not a kingdom minded perspective. The disciples were all about that. Hey, I want to be great. I want a position. I want a position. I want a position. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, whoever wants to be great must be the servant of all. So you start now. My little sister, my, they bug me. That, you want to be a leader? There's your training ground. There's your training ground. You can't even lead your siblings who are genetically programmed to follow you. <laughs> They're genetically programmed to look up to you. Mm-hmm. And you're annoyed by them? You feel like you need a bigger, listen, I I knew I'm called to be a leader. I'm going to start with Faith (laughs) and all her friends, Faith, Heather, look at their life. Look how solid they are. Mm -hmm. Look how smart they are. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking credit for that. I'm just saying they're genetically programmed to follow you. And you're annoyed by the littles. No, you're selfish. You're selfish. You want a bigger plan than that? Greg's older brother knew he was called to the ministry, but he had an opportunity to play football, right? Which is all of you guys. How many do this? And your family's going to celebrate that. Called to do the ministry. Hmm. You're not getting a graduation party. Okay. I've committed my life to something eternal. And because I'm not going to play baseball, now I, I suck. I'm going to get outcast from the family. You got to know the devil. You got to know what he looks like. Do you know what I'm saying? You got to know what the devil looks like. So anyways, he goes one semester or one year. Did he one year? And again, he didn't have what y'all have. He didn't have a youth group like this. He had a youth group, but you know what I'm saying? Like, not like this. So he went maybe one year. Uh, I'm thinking either two or three. Oh, because he's a couple years older than you. Yeah, because when I graduated... Okay. I think, I think he was either about to be a junior or senior. Greg was headed in the same way. He was going to be an engineer or an architect. Why? Because he's good at numbers. He's good at math. In those professions, what? They start with a different income. So that's what he's going to do. His brother reroutes, and what does he do? He reroutes. Facts. They're genetically... I'm, I keep making eye contact with all the babies. I need their older siblings in here. <laughs> They're ge- Georgie over here. Good. Okay, raise your hand if you have younger siblings. Wow. Wow. They're genetically programmed to follow you. You can't be annoyed by your... Th- that's your crew. Wow. That's, that's your crew. A, that's a big deal. You lead yourself. You lead them. You start practicing. They're genetically programmed to follow you. I've seen it time and time again. The oldest goes right, everyone else follows in line. 
The oldest peels off, starts acting carnal, so do the other ones. The reason this is such a holy moment it is because it absolutely has application to every single person in the room. And recently we had a connect with someone else who's also uh, does middle school ministry. And we were just, I was just going on and on about how much I love it, how much I love sixth through eighth graders. Now, the funny thing is he was like brand new in ministry, but we've been doing it for many, many years and still to this day love it. And so what the world despises is actually so valuable. It's actually so fulfilling. Really, that's the enemy. The enemy despises what it is that you're called to do. He would make little of what you're called to do. People in your family may make little of what you're called to do. But when you obey God's voice, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be ministry. It's you obeying your creator, the, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. When you heed his voice and you obey Man, I'm telling you, that's an honor unto him. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, those who honor him, he will in return honor. And those who uh, uh, is, uh, lightly esteem him or, or dishonor him will be lightly esteemed. And so when you do that and you honor God with your life, you will literally end up with the best life that you wouldn't trade for anything in the world. And so what the enemy despises, what your friends and family may despise is actually the most important thing, but it's your responsibility to hold on to it, to know what it is and to pursue it with all of your heart and to not let yourself become offended or despise your calling or despise his plan for your life through offense, through whatever. It doesn't matter what it is, through pride, through, through the love of money, right? So many different people. The Bible says when you compare yourself to others, that is not wise. So what somebody else is doing has nothing to do with, with what you're supposed to do. That's right. And so if you'll honor God in the things that he's instructed you to do, even like she said, in leading right now, leading those who are biologically programmed to follow you, start there and then look at Pastor Charity's leadership. We have people come up to us at conferences and they're like, hey, we watch Jumpstart on your, on your YouTube channel. And it's like, we don't even know them. They're, they're people from different states. Some guy from Africa comes up and says, we watch your YouTube channel. Someday we're going to come to Choose Life Church in Hobbs, New Mexico. And I was like, that's awesome. Where are you from? Africa. What? People in Africa watch our channel? Well, that influence didn't just start. It actually started way back when being faithful and being steward over little things. That's a biblical principle. He or she who is faithful over little will be made ruler over much. So I'm encouraging every single person in this room, be faithful right now with whatever it is that's in your hand to do. Don't despise it. Don't wish it was something else. Just be faithful. And we study, like 2 Timothy 2.15 says, so that we can eradicate or we can remove wrong mentalities from our life. We study what God's word says because we live in a system of counterfeit that says you've got to do this and this and this, and then you'll, you're going to be successful. And that's not what success looks like. Right. Success is you choose to crucify your desires. And in every single season, you honor the word of God. What does the word say right now? The word says to study. Can y'all bring my mic down a little bit? I'm feeding back. The word says to study. Number two, the word says to honor and obey those that have the rule over you. Number one, you're supposed to study. That's why we encourage you, have a quiet time every single day. Mm -hmm. That's why we have clipboards. That's why we have papers. That's why we preach. So that you're, that's part of studying. That's part of the lecture. And then you have to go home and you have to spend time with that. Mm -hmm. Number two, you've got to honor and be obedient to those who are, who have the rule over you. Mm -hmm. Whether that's teachers at school, your mom, your dad. And listen, I'm telling you right now, if you are not parented, you're in a rude, you're in for a rude awakening in your next season of life. So you better come up under somebody's authority. That's good. The earlier, the better. Because I've coached and led, led and pastored a lot of young adults who had never been parented, go through the internship for the very first time, and they have boundaries, they have responsibilities, they have to check in, and their flesh doesn't like it. Mm. Just like somebody on The Biggest Loser. They want to eat 45 Twinkies or whatever. If you don't know what The Biggest Loser is, look it up. It's an old television show. People losing weight, whatever. From about 75 years ago, you might not. Your flesh is like, you're, you're out of shape. You don't respect authority. You just perform for authority. That doesn't work. Jesus doesn't need your performance. He needs your faith and your obedience. So you learn right now. Number three, you, church is a priority. 
right now, church is a priority. And you're like, I'm already here. I know that. But it's not enough just to be here. You have to work it into your life. Mm -hmm. Having good relationships with each other, being good friends, holding each other accountable. If you're the kind of sibling that would leave your younger sibling outside all night, lock them out, that's that's a bad sibling, right? Can you imagine leaving Maddie outside all night? Exactly. Can you imagine leaving Sadie outside? (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) It's crossed his mind once or twice. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, for the record, but but we leave our brothers and sisters hanging. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We don't tell them the truth. We're not friendly. We don't invite them over. Nobody's calling. Nobody's hanging. Like with each other. That's important. Otherwise, you're just selfish. And all you think about is you and what you feel and what you want. You're catty. You're lying. You're gossip. Be sure your sin will find you out. It always does. It always does. It's so funny to me when people post things and do things and they think we're not going to find out just because we don't have it. The pastors will never know. I wish. What number did I give y'all? That's enough. Just focus on those three. You know what I'm saying? Renew your mind to that. Because culture, society says you don't need anybody. You should be able to do whatever you want to do. Be whatever you want to be. You want to be a girl today? You want to be a boy tomorrow? Be whatever you feel. You don't need church. God's everywhere. No, duh. Of course he is. That doesn't mean that you're everywhere. There's a set place for you. That's what 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says. And you're supposed to be in the house of God. You're supposed to serve in the house of God. You're supposed to submit in the house of God. Love each other in the house of God. I mean, the number of people that are in this room right now that already know they're called to the ministry is pretty staggering. It's our job to do everything we can to help you complete that assignment. And marketplace isn't excluded. But do you know that the habits that you're developing right now can go a long way in cooperating with what you're called to do later? That's why we have this service. Discipline, ride or die. And those of you that are older or whoever that applies to, you better eradicate that crap out of your mentality. Because I'm telling you what, this was the farthest definition of success I ever had for myself. Number one, not living in Hobbes. Number two, not going to be in the ministry. And number three, the worst place to be in the ministry. Ask anybody. That Youth ministry is like the butthole of ministry. <laughs> For most people's definitions. Not by my definition. Histor- so I don't feel sorry for you. Historically speaking. I want to knock the crap out of your head if you're, to- if you're still toying with that. Because it'll, it'll cost you everything. You'll be a short timer. We'll, re- we'll fast forward like a year, two years. Facts. You're gone. Bye. So let me say this. If you are aggressively parented, you, are, you should be so thankful. You're so blessed. But if you're not, man, you're so blessed because you're in church. And so you can actually acknowledge the fact that there's not strong leadership in my life by the way of strong parenting, but I can come up under the leadership of my pastors. I can submit to their leadership. I can allow them to bring correction in my life, just like Charity said, so that when you get older, you don't have this rude awakening, this reality check where it's like your flesh does not like to be told what to do. Your flesh does not like to be corrected. Well, guess what? You're going to be the kind of person that goes from job to job to job because nobody, church to church nobody's going to tell me what to do. And, and we've seen it. And what does that produce? That produces instability. Instability in marriages, instability in families, instability in finances, instability spiritually. And what does that produce? Instability everywhere. Everywhere. So it produces frustration. It produces uh, hatred, anger, all these different yeah. whirlwind of emotions. Addictions. And, and whose fault Bondages. is it? It's their fault. Because they never came up under an authority. They never, they never learned to what it looked like to submit. And so if you're here today and you're not strongly parented, you absolutely, it's a level playing field. Every single one of you have the same opportunity to allow, to crucify your own flesh. I put my body under. That's what Paul said. You put your flesh under. Write down that verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Again, guys, death, you were born to die. 
Please write that down. You're either going to choose to crucify your own flesh or the enemy will take you out. But death is in your future. I'm going to do it myself. I'll do it myself. I don't need his help. I'm going to die to self and live to him. Amen. Otherwise, you live for the devil, you live for self, and you die. Living for the devil is living for self. You die. Death of your marriage, just like Pastor Greg said. Death of your future. Death of your peace. Death of your joy. Not a good situation. Death, 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 death everywhere. Death, death. death is everywhere. Certain death. death, death, death. When you just, just crucify your flesh for that 15 minutes in this season, you know? I'm not going to listen to what I don't know I don't need to listen to. I'm not going to watch what I know I don't need to watch. Like, I'm done with that. You just draw a line in the sand. I'm done with that. Come on, guys. You we know, live in the desert. And it's like there's sand everywhere. Just go out exactly. There and draw a line. It's easy to draw a line in the sand. Well, we've had <laughs> students before, like, you know, break the device. Get, do whatever you got to do. You know, when maybe Jesus says, like, pluck out your, your eyes. first. <laughs> right. But when Jesus said, pluck out your eyes, he didn't mean pluck out your eyes, but literally, like, be aggressive. Take, it Take very a stand. Seriously. Take a stand. You've been taking a stand. Come on. You're still riding the fence. That's like, painful. well, it, it just, uh, uh. I'm telling you, one year in, I'm out. <laughs> this is the worst job ever. You faster, done, uh-uh. One year, I'm out. Yeah, Not no. successful. Yeah, no. No, no, it's horrible. Going to games and stuff. Oh, man. They invite go, you to when lunch. When we used to go to prom and it would smell so terrible Oh, in yeah, there. they invite you, but then it's they like, don't talk to you the whole time. Because they were oxygen, lying. Oxygen they actually mask. have, like, people are sleeping with and, like, exactly. hooking up with. So you walk in the room and then Those everybody are not ignores dance moves. you. Exactly. You know what I mean? They invite you to go to school, lunch, and then you get there and they don't even talk to you. Oh, come on. Uh-uh, say I'm that, out. PC. I'm out on that. The, it's like, nah, sure, nah, I'll go. Nah. I'll be there for you. And then it's like, nah. Uh-uh. To the nah, nah, nah. Hell to the nah, <laughs> to the nah, nah, No, nah. I ain't doing that. Don't ask me to go to your lunch. Uh-uh, I ain't going to uh-uh. your lunch. I go to service. Only to be ghosted. I'm not you. going to your, no. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Going to your game? Uh-uh, I ain't going to your game. <laughs> not your game. Not anyone else's game. Mm-hmm. I got a game in here. We're going to play some games. Mm-hmm. Basket, Bible, all oh, they're great. All they're kinds the best of games. games ever. Three people running inside the circle when there should be four. I'll show you games. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Good eye, good eye. I didn't see that. She's like, 10 second penalty. I'm like, 10 seconds, that's a lot. She's like, he's not even in there. Like, that's good. You're right. You're right. Make it 20. No, no faster way to feel unsuccessful than be a youth pastor for nine months. Fast track. Fast track to feeling like crap about yourself, youth pastor, nine months. But on the bright side, the willing and obedient. Exactly. You can't go by that. The best of the best. We know people who make a ton of money. Facts. Miserable. Don't stay married. Always chasing the next high. Mm -hmm. Got a drink to get through a date. And I'm not talking about people who are Christians. I'm talking about people who are Christians. Facts. So let's not, let's not buy into the lie. Amen. Let's, let's really decide. Okay. Like what is success? What is success? What is success? That's what you have to renew your mind to. What, what is success for me? Success is John 17, four. That I complete mm. down to the last detail, detail the what he told me to do. Success isn't a dollar amount. Right. It's not a house. That's right. It's not a car. That's right. It's not a relationship. If, if getting married is the definition of success, well, what's, what's the point of living after we got married? Right. We'd already done everything Why we were ever so going to do. Why are so many miserable married people? People have all these milestones. If success was graduating from high school, anybody can do that in New Mexico. <laughs> I mean, not if you go to the co-op or you're homeschooled. Y'all are going to actually, actually have graduated. Learn. Y'all are going to actually have learned something. Give As opposed a hand. to going to the next grade because you're one year older. Congratulations, you're one year older. Nope. Okay, that's not success. Success is a dollar amount. That's not success. Mm-mm. Success is hearing well done at the end of your life. Yeah. That's what success is. So you have to keep that in front of you. Success is seeking first the kingdom. You know, I had friends, oh, you just want to have fun. My friend's parents told my parents, the kids just need to have fun. Like fun is the definition of success. And what does that even mean? I have fun every day of my life. Like if you knew how much I laughed every day, you wouldn't believe it. Nobody has more fun than us. 
There's no way. There's no way people laugh as much as we laugh. I'm serious. If we're not preaching, preparing to preach, or planning things at church, we're laughing. Hands down. If we're eating, we're laughing. If we're driving, we're laughing. If we're not preaching, preparing to preach, like planning an event, Mm -hmm. facts, we're laughing. Because there's no joy outside of the Holy Ghost. There's no joy outside of his plan for your life. So if you don't have joy, you're not in position. And you got to practice that position. Congratulations. You're on the team. You got to practice it. How do you practice it? You study. You're obedient. Well, I feel like I do all the chores. You probably do. So just do them and stop complaining about it. At least you have a house. At least you have chores. At least you have a bed, a couch, something. You know what I mean? There's people that are sleeping under bridges tonight and going to shelters for food. Mm -hmm. You know? It's a grateful Sunday, y'all. Be grateful. Stop being a victim. It doesn't look good on you. If you've ever like worn a color and it's like that color doesn't look good on you. A hundred percent. Victim doesn't look good on a believer. It doesn't look good on you. Mm-mm. You're just crying and moping. And... <sighs> That's all I got. Hallelujah. You know, so. every single one of us in the room, we all have flesh. And flesh doesn't like to be told what to do. Flesh doesn't like to be corrected. But the difference between those of us in the room who experience success and those in the room that experience failure is those who are willing to be corrected. They're willing to allow the word to bring adjustment or make adjustments to their life or show them the adjustments that they need to make. That's why I constantly pray that, that we would see the adjustments that we need to make. Right? That's what we're to be conformed to his image. Well, who's going to conform us? Is he going to cram us into his mold? No. No. We're going to cram ourselves into the mold and say, I want to conform my life so that I look like Jesus. And the way I walk in love, the way I discipline myself, the way I crucify my flesh, the way I discipline myself to make God my God and not social media my God or YouTube my God. Right? We, of our own cord, of our own volition, we make a decision, a choice to conform our life to what the Word of God says. And that's what we're asking you guys to do. Right. Well, we started with meat. Let's finish with meat. Okay? Raw meat contains toxins that are not good for your body. So it needs a little heat. Okay? That's why we're bringing the heat today. Your flesh needs heat. Mm -hmm. Remember, John said, I baptize you with water. Matthew 3.11. But one's coming after me who will baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. Hallelujah. So you need the fire on your flesh. Yeah. The fire of anointed pre- preaching. I mean, an athlete has to put pressure on its body in order for it to perform. That's right. So you need the fire of the word and the Holy Ghost to burn those toxins out of you. That's why they encourage you, even if you like your steak rare, they encourage you at the bottom, like... You're prone to foodborne illnesses. <laughs> you like your steak rare. Good luck. Because the things, your help. the things weren't cooked out of the meat. Mm-hmm. So I'm telling you, a fleshly Christian friend, toxic. 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 Absolutely. Right? And it gets, it gets on you. Their offenses, their carnality, their outlook, the way they're trying to mix parts of the world's mentality with the words mentality. Have you guys ever Those heard the, the phrase, if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still, still a, pig. a pig. So it doesn't matter how you paint it. A toxic friend is still a toxic friend. Right. And toxic doesn't have fire filled relationship with the word and the spirit. You can't be religious. That's why we encourage you guys to be sharp because iron sharpens iron. One person is supposed to sharpen the countenance of their friend. But if you're not sharp, then actually, and you, you're spending all that time with someone who's dull, they're going to make you dull. Right. Which is, which is like a, a very soft way of saying it. Like, it's going to be a major problem. Right. So you don't want to be around toxic people. You want to be around people. And, and that doesn't mean perfect. It means people who say, yes, God's word is the final authority. Yes. Well, I need to change. I need to grow. There's things I need to cut out of my life. Someone who's in process 
not somebody who's flippant and casual and not passionate about the word and not passionate about change and not passionate about being conformed to his image. That's a problem. Does that well, make sense? And the thing about it is like, that's why. So like, I remember in math, math class, probably more than any others, because every single day, typically in middle school in math, I had homework. So the teacher would get up, she would lecture us on whatever concept we were learning and like turn out the lights, write all the problems on the screen that went on the overhead. And we would follow along with the notes, but then we would have homework that basically required us to go home and do something with her lecture. Mm -hmm. Sermons aren't lectures in the sense that they're powerless. The anointed word preached has a way of sticking with you and changing you. But at the same time, that principle is true. Mm -hmm. It's like every week when you come to church, you're receiving the lecture. You're receiving the concept. And it's your job to go home and work that into your life. And if you don't go home and work it into your life, then when the test comes, and guys, the life tests come, somebody offers you a joint. Somebody says, hey, send me a picture. Mm -hmm. Somebody asks you out. Somebody invites you to the party. Something pops up. Okay, just because something pops up doesn't mean you have to look at it. Right? Something will pop up. Something's going to, there's going to be a life test. And God's not the one that's doing the test. And how you have studied, not how you've been taught. How you have studied is going to determine pass or fail the test. Not even your relationship with me right? and Pastor Greg. We love you. We're for you, but we can't pass your tests for you. You have to pass your own tests, which is why your Christianity is primarily practiced privately. Right. Please write it down. Your Christianity is primarily practiced privately. Your Christianity is primarily practiced privately. Just like you clean your body privately, you got to work on your soul just by yourself. Mm -hmm. Will you text me? Let's read the Bible together. There's some things you got. You need to know how to do them. Come on. You need to learn how to do them. Pastor Greg, he has his own time with the Lord and I have my own time with the Lord. I go to the Lord and he sorts me out, gets my flesh in check. He goes to the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? I just need people. No, you need to quit being a baby. You clean yourself privately. You go into the bathroom, you shut the door. You clean yourself privately. You practice and develop strong Christian disciplines that clean your soul up, your mind, your will, your emotions privately. You get behind closed doors, you make your confessions. What did Jesus say? Stop being all about, and so many people do that. They get up on the stage and they think, well, if I look the part on the stage, if I text Pastor Charity, if I talk to Pastor Charity, then she's going to think everything's good. This is not a performance. This is not a performance. You have to, behind closed doors, do the work. You practice your Christianity privately. You let the Holy Spirit work on you. Jesus said, you're religious. You want to pray publicly and be seen. This is what you should do. Go into your closet and shut the door. Mm -hmm. Why did he say that? Are you literally supposed to get in your closet? No, he's saying you need a private place. Right. You need a private place and shut the door because he wants to talk to you. Right. Just like you shut the door. And if you don't, that's like a weird kind of thing that we're not going to unpack. Okay? But you need to be in the bathroom by yourself. There's like a curtain. Pull the curtain. You know what I'm saying? Like you do these things privately Mm -hmm. to your physical body, which is actually dirt and dust. But your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart flow the issues of life. So that's where it really counts. I mean, everyone needs to clean. You need to clean yourself, okay? You need to scrub all the places. Use the little something. There doesn't need to be smells. Okay? If people Take a jo- shower daily, please. People joke about it. Wear deodorant, please. You know, you go on camp at the middle school boys. That doesn't have to be a thing. You guys can change time by like not smelling. Time. You know what I mean? Yes. Just clean yourself. That's important. Bathe. Bathe. Amen. 
But like, honestly, your Christianity is private, primarily worked out privately. Are you doing any work? Are you doing any studying? Looking up the words, having different translations. How many of you have more than one Bible translation? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a good amount of you. The rest of you that don't, it's free on BibleGateway.com. That's right. So you can study. You don't have to have all the Bibles. And it's actually easier because it's way lighter. Y'all, Pastor Greg has so many Bibles. He, he like collects Bibles, basically. ESV. He has all the Bibles. Living Bible, Message Bible, Amplified Classic. Y'all, he has so King many Bibles. When, Look, today I brought my new King James. When I just got my car... The guy that sold him the car gave him a Bible. Boom, got another one. I'm trying to remember what translation that was. I think it was ESV. ESV, I think. He has so many Bibles, right? But you got to carry all those around. It's on your thing, so you can study. One verse stands out to you in Proverbs. How many of you do your daily Bible reading or your quiet time? Okay. I don't see y'all. If you turn them in, they go to Pastor Faith. But I'm excited to announce that like three high schoolers do them. Let's go. All three of them. These are low stats. Just saying. We're coming up. Amen. So anyway, you read Proverbs 19 today. You really like this verse. Well, what does it say in the message? So good. What does it say in, the, you know, just like study it and then memorize it. Message is good. Write it down. Bible. Remember, okay, that's found in Proverbs 19, 25. Pastor Jerry is so good at that. Doesn't take that much time. Remembering the address. Comes in handy. Let us pray, let, let us pray, pray everywhere, everywhere and every day, every moment of the day, it is the right time. Also, Amen. this message is available on the Shoes Life Church YouTube channel. I encourage you to listen to it. It's very good and fill in the blanks. Amen. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're in here today, if you've never... <laughs>